Hadouken! What's up boys and girls, welcome back to another long awaited seed to harvest episode. This episode will be packed with garden tips, grow hacks, DIY setups and a whole lot more. Because this is our first grow in a new country, in a new state and in a new grow environment since our move from the Caribbean. The change from the humid and warm Caribbean islands to the cold and dry rocky mountains of Colorado USA was a big one. It was painful ripping down your grow setup but it's exciting thinking of the new possibilities and a new grow space. And with a new setup comes the chance to run a few new strains as well. Now before we get started, this Seed to Harvest documentary is strictly for educational purposes only. Everything is absolutely legal where the show is filmed. Now that's out of the way, if you love or hate setting up a new grow as much as I do, then grab your measuring tapes and your buds and let's get jiggy, cause in this episode we're getting up and close with the platinum garlic from in-house genetics, and trust me boys, she's a winner, and as always, we'll judge her at the end in our sweep all keep segment, where we determine if it's worth the smoke or if it's a complete joke, so smash the like button, grab your lighters, roll one up and let's get lit with the ICANN fam. If this is your first time on the channel, welcome to the ICANN THC channel. We drop grow tips, bust myths, and our goal is to help you grow better, faster. Perfect. So hit that notification bell down below. Oh, and by the way, we've been giving out free stuff to all patrons and VIPs get exclusive packs as well. So join up with the ICANN fam if you haven't already. ICANN fam, that's what's up, man. Hey, Scotty. Yo! What's up? Now before we can even get into popping any beans, we had to get our grow space set up. We had absolutely nothing set up literally nothing but i did have a few key pieces of equipment that i kept and brought along with me because i knew that i would need them to get things going and the key point here is guys if you've not got everything that you need when you first start off you can slowly add as you go and perfect your setup when we first started off we posted this picture and there were people who laughed at us and called us broke thc but bit by bit we were able to improve our setup Perfect. and you guys will be able to see firsthand in this episode exactly how we did that all i had was a basement the shape was not ideal and it definitely wasn't huge, but it was workable. There was a huge heater system in the middle of the room and it was pretty short in terms of headspace, so I knew I'd have to do some improvising. I laid down some tarp covering because the floor was straight concrete and there were no tiles or anything like that. This tarp would help me manage the dust and would make sweeping and keeping the room clean a little bit easier. I had a couple burp lights from Walmart, they were okay for seedlings but I knew that I needed some more power. So first off I took my Amaris Hydro FC6500 out of the box and I fixed it up directly to the ceiling using some hooks and ratchet hangers. I gotta say, I love Mars Hydro's lights and the FC6500 is a beast. It lit up the whole room like a piece of cake. Now it's important to know guys, when you're growing you gotta be able to pivot and make changes to adapt to different things that may happen in the grow room. Life can throw you curveballs and you need to be able to deal with it and sometimes a tool that can help you be versatile is a grow tent. I know I wanted to use the whole room but I also knew that I wanted to use at least one grow tent in there. Because of the shape and size of the room, it will be a challenge though. For me, I love using tents for either veg or flower simply because they give me a controlled environment which is free from light leaks. That's a big plus for me. Light leaks can cause all sorts of problems during flower so having a tent dedicated to vegging or flowering plants can be a huge asset to any home grower. For this setup, my thinking was I'd veg in one tent and flower in the room itself. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, I guess you're about to see about that. So now that we got the FC6500 up and running, I needed a dedicated veg space. Most grow tents would be either way too tall for my grow room or just wouldn't fit period. So I decided to go with one of the smaller tents in the market, the 2x4 grow tent. The 2x4 foot grow tent I've used it multiple times before, even on this channel. But when I left the Caribbean, I sold all my tents and my carbon filters. But I kept my trusty lights. So I had experience with the 2x4 tents before and I pulled some solid plants in that setup. So bearing that in mind, I decided to go for the 2x4 tent. Once it arrived at my door, I set it up and then brought it into the grow room. I had a few plants on the floor in the grow room, that's why I didn't set it up in there and even bringing it in after was no easy task. But eventually, we made it happen. Now like I told you guys, the grow space was a little awkward, so it's one that I would need to think about to maximize the potential with. So after an amazing smoke sesh, I had a stroke of genius. I decided to flip the 2x4 tent on its side, so I can get even more space, at the expense of course of some height. But that was a perfectly fine trade off for me. 
instead of fitting a couple plants, I could fit way more plants in there, especially if I was using the tent as a veg tent. Now, have you guys ever had to get super innovative in the grow room? If you have, drop a comment down below and let me know what you did. You know what they say though, necessity is the mother of invention. Anyway, I was super pleased with how the 2x4 tent fit on its side in a corner of the room. Almost some unused space next to the heating system, like talk about maximizing your grow space. Shout out to Mary Jane for the inspiration, that was an awesome smoke sesh. I can still taste that strain now, mmm, that platinum garlic. Now to light up the 2x4 tent, I used my super solid Mars Hydro SP3000. This light is fantastic and I've had it for a few years now and it still runs like the day I copped it. Literally, this fixture puts out tremendous amounts of light and it will absolutely light up any 2x4 tent, no matter how you flip the tent. I love this light because it's perfect for longer, more rectangular spaces like closets and storage cabinets. Pretty much all of the Mars Hydro lights have external dimmers which make increasing and decreasing brightness a breeze. I barely run any of my lights on 100% brightness, simply because of how powerful they are. There's simply no need to burn or stress your girls with that, or to use up that much electricity. Now Moss Hydro has great grow equipment and their lights rock. Check out their website and use the discount code ICANTHC to snag a discount on all their products. They got sales running all the time, there's actually one running right now for the entire month. So use the discount code ICANTHC and snag a double discount fam. Don't miss out on that, you can thank me later. And all that said, here's a tip for everyone growing in tents. When plants are placed in an enclosed space, they can transpire or sweat. The more plants you have in an enclosed space, the higher your humidity levels will be. So pretty much, the more plants and more foliage and more leaves that are in there, the more the humidity levels will rise. So to combat that, I got a small 4 inch inline fan to pull some of that stale humid air out of the grow tent. This worked great to manage the air circulation and gave me a little bit of negative air pressure in the tent as well. So things are starting to come together nicely and shape up really good in the grow room so let's switch things up and see how the plants are doing. Now this is not first time running in house genetic stuff. I'm a huge fan of in house and their strains always check the right boxes for me. I've tried their dirty kush breath and their sugar cane and did a seed to harvest episode of them both on this channel so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. We also had a great time kicking with Brandon on the Meet the Breeder episode on the Talking Loud podcast, where he broke down exactly what makes some of these strains from in-house genetics so much fire, and he dropped the bomb letting us know that everything the platinum touches turns to frost. And then as you guys can see, everything that that platinum has touched after that has just basically uh, taken, taken the trichome build and just taken it to a whole, whole different level, you know? And today boys, we're showcasing the Platinum Garlic by In-House Genetics. The Platinum Garlic is a cross of GMO and Platinum, so you know there's gonna be some frost. It's loved by many for an impressive 30% THC level. She's got an amazing gassy aroma and that Platinum, it shortens the flowering time and adds some flair, as well as mold resistance all to the mix. She's an indica leaning heavy hitter and is not recommended for a daytime smoke. So it's my kind of daytime smoke, if you know what I mean. Now I wasted no time in ripping open the pack and popping these beans. We had so much going on already that I wanted a simple solution for germination, so I popped these beans directly into solar cups filled with potting mix and dynamico, and I sprayed Qualitrips germination booster directly over top to moisten the medium. I did this for about 2-3 to three days and then saw signs of life as the seedlings burst through the soil. The germination booster, man that shit is amazing, and what would have taken me 7 or 8 days or just never happened at all, took me 2 days. Time is money and the Qualtrips germination booster saves a ton of time. Now Dynamico also works great as a mycorrhizal inoculant to promote healthy and strong roots. Our seedlings can be very fragile and need lots of humidity. Because I popped a few beans at the same time, I popped them all into humidity domes to keep the RH high. Seedlings can also flop over super easily if they aren't exposed to gentle breezes to strengthen their stalks, so keep that in mind. During the seedling stage, I did not do much at all, I just let the seedlings grow. I did get a little bit too hyped to transplant and I could have left them in their solar cups a little bit longer, but after a week or so, I cut them out of their solar cups and then transplanted them into 5 gallon grow bags filled with potting mix. Now these grow bags are great because they are a great alternative to expensive pots. They are made of strong polyethene and are super thin. The black interior and white exterior is perfect for blocking light and helps with algae, mildew and pest control all while reflecting that light. 
The bags have drain holes as well, which help avoid root rot, and they're super easy to store when you aren't using them. They're just awesome. Now, as time passed, the seedlings grew into veg nicely. For nutrients, I added Neptune's Harvest Dry Organic Amendments like kelp and lobster shell, which contain calcium and chitin, and I also fed them some Alaska fish fertilizer during veg. This is a liquid organic solution, and it's great because I use it alongside the Neptune's Harvest stuff. The great thing about Neptune's Harvest is that they've got both liquid and dry organic fertilizer, and you can use it in place of or alongside your existing nutrient lineup. Their stuff rocks, and I absolutely love friggin' fish fertilizers. Try them out today and use the discount code ICANTHC to snag a discount on all Neptune's Harvest products. Now guys, I got an admission to make. Now similarly to earlier where I was super eager, maybe too eager to transplant the seedlings, I was also a bit impatient to flip to flower. No, she, she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready. Impatience may be a theme of this run, simply because I was super eager to get to harvest. I had two other plants which were far into flower and due to overfeeding some bloom nutrients that I had never used before, they both died a sudden and tragic death. So the loss of those two plants made me even more eager to get to harvest, which in hindsight is never a good thing. You know what they say, patience is a virtue and virtue is a grace and grace is a girl who does not wash her face. Bruh. Shout out to grace. But all jokes aside, patience is super important and if there's one thing you guys need to take away from this episode is to always be patient. It definitely pays off in the end. But all that said, I knew I'd be doing a perpetual harvest and I could have waited longer and veg for longer. But all I needed was that first harvest to get the ball rolling. Plus, I'd already popped a few more beans for the next run. So once I've decided that these plants had enough tops, which would translate into bud size during flower, I decided to change the timers and flip the room to flower. To increase the bud size, I topped and did low stress training using LSD clips. The more bud sites equal the more buds. It's always about the buds, right? Now, as we all know, nothing ever runs smoothly when you want it to though, right? So of course, soon after flipping to flower, we noticed that we had a bit of an issue. What started out as a couple fungus gnats became more of a problem. I honestly feel like these fungus gnats came into the grow room in a bag of expert gardener potting mix which I scooped up from Walmart. This potting mix was not the best at all, but it got the job done, at the cost of us having to battle some of these friggin' fungus gnats. Now I tried all sorts of sprays, sticky traps, diatomaceous earth, and a lot more, but nothing seemed to work. Eventually, my homie Norma G suggested that I use perlite as a preventative measure. After thinking about it, it made tons of sense. Fungus gnats love to lay eggs in moist soils. Whenever I saw them, they were parading and chillaxing on the medium. I even saw him running around on the DE as if they were having fun on the beach. I decided to take Norma G's advice and I took the plants outdoors, scraped out the top few inches of the medium and replaced it with perlite. This would have two or maybe three main effects. It would get rid of any fungus gnat eggs or larvae in the top layer of the soil. It would also allow me to replace that contaminated layer with perlite and that perlite dries out a lot quicker and protects the soil from fungus gnats and makes it a little bit more difficult for fungus gnats to lay any eggs in there. So the result was, you guessed it, a lot less fungus gnats. This coupled with some of the low cost plant therapy and we were able to keep them at bay. So for everyone wondering what's up with the pictures on my IG that's got some beautiful white layering on top of my medium, well that's what it is and that's why. Oh yeah, and follow our main account and our backup account on IG. We post daily behind the scenes content on there so don't miss it fam. Now once we were able to get the fungus gnat situation at bay, things started to look up. The plants preflowering pistols were booming and the flowers were progressing nicely. I did not use any extra nutrients during flower for these girls, I just let them do their thing. The slow release organic amendments from Neptune's harvest, they were great and gave the plants the food they needed when they needed it. The extra calcium and chitin really helped these girls grow strong and push through in the face of those fungus gnats. To find out more about the benefits of micronutrients like calcium, chitin and even silica, be sure to subscribe to the channel and check out our guaranteed grow tip videos. We drop knowledge almost every day to help you guys out. Now as we got further into flower, these girls got stinkier and stinkier. Personally, I love the smell of hard, dank flower. So you already know your boy was in terpene heaven. 
whatever the combination of turps, I friggin loved it. Man, I wish we could make an air freshener with that smell, it was so damn good. At this point, I had no carbon filter setup either, so the smell was just loud. The nugs gradually got bigger and bigger until they seemed like they were just rock solid. Even just to the touch, sometimes you'd find flowers that are super soft or airy, but this is nothing like that. I'm talking buds of stone. These things were solid AF. Now you can also see some of the traits of the platinum coming through because there was definitely a lot of frost being packed onto these girls. They were lovely. Now I mentioned being impatient. I transplanted the seedlings earlier than what I usually would have and I flipped a flower earlier than I usually would have. All with the main aim of getting my perpetual harvest started. But when it came to the actual harvest, man I legit took my time and I did not rush the chop at all. These girls just looked and smelled way too good to chop down. Plus, I know that the risk of harvesting too early is way worse than transplanting too soon. I've harvested too early and you lose a lot of the taste and smell. Plus, your flowers can bulk up a lot during the last few days before it actually finishes. Everyone has their own personal preferences as to when they like to harvest their flower. Different harvest times give you different effects. Some people go for that clear and cloudy combo while other people prefer cloudy with some amber. For me, I like a mix of amber and cloudy trichomes. Doing your trichomes is the most accurate way to determine when to harvest your flower. Some growers go off pistols or thyme, but that can be less accurate in my experience. I use a USB microscope to determine when to harvest my flowers. The USB microscope works great to zoom into those trichomes and you'd be amazed at what you can see. Some growers also use cell phone cameras or jeweler's loops as well, but I found those to be a little bit less reliable, but again, that's just in my experience. Now drop a comment down below and let me know what you use to harvest your flowers. When do you do it? What do you look for? What do you use? I'm always interested to find out what you guys and gals gotta say. Now harvest time is the most important time. It takes, you guessed it, patience. Seems like a running theme, eh? I told you it was gonna be a running theme. Anyway, the actual chopping down of your plants takes a couple seconds or minutes at most, but the dry and cure is where you can make or break your entire growth. You can make the turbs pop or you can make the turbs drop. And trust me, when they drop, you lose them and your stuff can taste like hay. And that's a big nay. Now your environment, you gotta keep that in play cause that's a big part of your dry and cure process. So for me, I chopped these girls down and because it's super dry in the mountains, I hung this plant pretty much up whole. I used my 2x4 grow tent as a drying tent and it helped me to slow down the dry process a bit. The faster the plant dries, the more likely it is to lose its flavor and potency and taste like hay. I always try to aim for a slow, control the dry. I left these girls to dry for about 10 days. I'm drying for about 14 days now and things are looking good. The sugar leaves curled into the flowers to protect them almost like little bud blankets. Once they were dried, I trimmed the buds off from the main branches and popped them into some jars to cure. Sometimes I use grove bags, but I just use jars for this run. The curing process is super important. I aim for a cure period of about one month to six weeks. In general, the longer the better. Curing pretty much involves the aging or drying the harvested plant material to fine tune the moisture content and allow for the decay of sugars and chlorophyll before consumption. Many plants are cured, such as sagebush, bay leaves, tea leaves, and even tobacco. How long do you cure your flower for? I know some people that do it for a long time and I know some people that don't cure at all. Where do you stand? Drop it in the comments down below and let me know. Now this platinum garlic was a robust, resilient, dank, and loud friggin strain. The platinum traits really shone through and I absolutely enjoyed tasting it. Even a few months after harvest, like right now, and it's still going really strong in terms of the flavor profile, gassiness, and potency. It's definitely a strain that I will grow again, and probably very, very soon. So it's definitely a keeper. If you ever ran the platinum garlic, drop it in the comments down below and let me know how it turned out. I did not do a dry weigh in with these girls, but without a doubt, had I given them longer of a veg period, then the yield would have been a lot heavier. But a few months later, and we still got some left, so hey, that works for me. Now, huge shout out to everyone who's joined the hashtag ICANFAM on Patreon. You guys friggin' rock. Now, we got loads of things planned for you guys, from free stuff to exclusive Patreon only content. We're having fun over there, man. Tons of fun. So come and join. We got tons of gold boxes filled with packs and goodies for VIPs. So join up if you haven't already. Now, smash that like button if you enjoyed this epic seed to harvest episode, because I sure did. If you did, drop a comment down below and let me know. If you didn't, still drop a comment down below and let me know. Thanks for watching, homies, and we see you on the next one. Stay high. And stay fly. Peace.